It's a cold, rainy day at the end of May as winter sets in uh, in Cape Town. We're still locked down because of coronavirus. So this is yet another lockdown lecture. I've been looking at Jesus in Africa. Uh, the, the last 2,000 years of, of Christianity on the continent and the, the ebb and flow of the Christian faith in our continent. And I've been doing this in partnership with Discipling Nations, who uh, are an organization that I, I am engaged with, and we teach grassroots level uh, mission. Uh, all around this area. Today we're going to look, as I promised yesterday, at uh, the movie The Mission with Robert De Niro and Jeremy Irons. Uh, I'm looking for an equivalent movie about Africa. This one, we, we take a break from Africa and we, we go to South America. We also jump back an era into the 1700s when this movie is set but the issues I haven't come across a movie that raises the issues of colonialism and admission as well quite as well or quite as movingly um, and as intelligently quite frankly as as this movie um, so I hope you have had a chance to see it otherwise this is going to be a monstrous spoiler <laughs> It's really worth watching it and typically in my my lectures when I was lecturing I would I would spend a lecture day watching this movie with the class a very sobering um, but I think a very important um, piece of work so we're going to think about as we as <laughs> As we, we go through the movie, as I go through this review, we're going to think about, are there, are there any surprises? Is there anything you disagree with? Is there anything that you, you find challenging or helpful or stimulating? Is there, is there anything that you find horrifying? Um, all these things are, are, are signs that, that you need to, to investigate further, think more deeply, uh, ask more questions. <laughs> Uh, seek God to find the answers for for what is mission what is mission what should mission be and what has it been I'm going to switch over to to my slides at this point uh, I haven't mastered this toggle switch it doesn't respond to my fingers there we go Right, now there's a saying in Africa, when elephants fight, the grass is trampled. And the two elephants fighting here were Spain and Portugal, both vying for territory and uh, uh, monopolization of the trade from, from South America. And the grass in this equation were the Guarani Indians. The, the area marked there uh, in that circle is the area where the Guaran the, the original area where the Guarani tribe uh, hunted and lived their lives uh, and they found themselves in a pinch between the northward aspirations of Spain and the southward aspirations of Portugal and uh, this took place it's based the movie is based on events that took place in 1750 and it raises all sorts of issues. Is mission a partner to colonialism? Is mission the spearhead of oppression? Is mission the conscience of invaders? Uh, is it an agent of global uniformity? Is it a champion of human rights? Is it an ideological enslaver? All of these issues are, are raised and, and examined by this powerful piece of work. The movie starts really with, with the narrator, Cardinal Altamirano. He's, he's writing this letter, and the letter forms the, the thread of narration in the movie. And he's been sent from Rome to South America to sort out a missionary mess. Well, it's a sort of political religious problem, really, that he's asked to solve. 
the plot line is is based around his reports. He he writes and he crosses out. It's quite uh, well done uh, about what he decided and and what resulted from the church's decision. And um, the movie begins with with a in a jungled area where where a group of of Indians is has tied a a, a European uh, missionary to a facsimile cross made out of rough logs, and they push him in the water and over the waterfall where he falls to his death. And immediately, one's one's confronted with the question: Why, why kill him? Why, why did they decide that he needed to be killed? Had he said or done things that were offensive? Was the idea of Jesus in itself a a trigger for uh, hateful resistance? Um, did they read him as a representative of oppressors? Was he simply too strange? Um, we we don't know. We never get told the the answers to those questions. But it's it's the point of punctuation. It's where where the story unfolds. Now, the head of the Jesuit chapter that's uh, living in the town down on the coast, <clears throat> who commissioned the the missionary who was killed to go, it's called Father Gabriel. And he comes to the conclusion, he says, I sent him, I have to go up there myself. Um, They've obviously had a, have a sense of calling from God and someone must go and someone has to go. And, and in his, I don't know, remorse or sorrow at, at this, the brother who has been killed, um, Father Gabriel decides that he himself, as leader of the chapter, needs to take the lead and, and go up the waterfall down which the missionary has been pushed and make contact with this dangerous tribe. And we've got to ask ourselves, how are mission links with martyrdom? I'd love to stop and, and have a conversation at every point here. And how does a mission link with sacrifice? And, um, yeah, I'm going to be doing a session later in this lecture series on Christian death in Africa and this this idea of of being prepared to die for the sake of getting the gospel to uh, people who have not heard of it before. Very interesting. And so he starts climbing up next to the the uh, <clears throat> The waterfall, and we've got to ask ourselves why. You know, it seems likely that if he doesn't fall down and kill himself in the in the climb up the waterfall, um, he might well get killed by the by the people he's going to. So, what's his motivation? Is is he acting here as an agent of colonializing power? Is that a is that a powerful enough motivation to to motivate someone to do what? Gabriel, Father Gabriel does. Is he a fanatical ideologue? Um, does he have a sense of love or a sense of calling? What's going on? What's motivating this man and many other men and women like him? Because it does seem on one scale that, that missionaries are, are potentially really mad, insane. You know, did God want the Guarani to be exposed to the gospel? Did the Guarani want to be exposed to the gospel? <laughs> Patently not. Did the church want the Guarani to be exposed to the gospel? Well, there is a question. <laughs> and for the most part, it seems that um, the Jesuits were, <clears throat> in this instance, were were um, not sort of not mainstream church. But we'll come to that later. And uh, and so he he 
makes he makes his way into the heartland of the Guarani. Um, climbs up the waterfall barefoot. Isn't there a better way? I mean, there weren't any helicopters in those days, but um, the Guarani had have withdrawn themselves from uh, Western contact uh, for various reasons that will become clear. Um, they've barricaded themselves behind the Iguazu Falls. Oh. So, isn't there a better way? And and also, what cultural baggage does Father Gabriel take with him? You know, what's in that bag? We see this mysterious wrapped item that he carries. Is it a gun? It's not a gun. Uh, it's a clarinet. The clothes he's wearing, the cross around his neck. He takes the cross from the that the dead missionary has floated down the river with. He puts it around his neck and, and takes it up as as a symbol of continuing what the the dead brother has started. But that's a very important question because moving from one culture to another, you do not go empty handed. You carry on your back a weight of cultural baggage. And what you do with that baggage is very important. Anyway, he goes up, gets to the top of the the uh, waterfall, and he takes out his clarinet and begins to play. And, and as he plays, the Indians emerge from the jungle and circle around him. He just plays. No words are spoken. They, their bows are drawn. They, but they are just... Uh, so moved by the music um, and it's an int it's interesting to to look at that at how Father Gabriel handled his first contact uh, and how the Guarani Indians reacted with a sort of wistfulness and uh, the chief gets angry and snaps the clarinet in half and but then the other uh, other uh, tribal members uh, plead with the chief and give the clarinet back to Father Gabriel, but now, of course, it's broken. And anyway, in the end, they, they lead him by the hand and give him permission to live and to live amongst them. So, I mean, we've got to ask, in mission, who's more important, the missionary or the people that he or she approaches? Who's got the power? Where does the power lie? Um, who's weak and who is strong in this interaction? Oh, so much that I'd like to talk. Every aspect of this movie raises uh, crucial I issues with regard to mission and uh, very transferable to, to other intercultural contact points. But there's another Westerner who comes into contact with the Guarani. It's uh, Rodrigo Mendoza, who's a slave trader. He comes in with his net, catches slaves, shoots people who run away. Um, he's hunting above the falls. And uh, he has a, a fleeting confrontation with Father Gabriel. And... Um, this is a very different power relation, well-armed, supe with superior weaponry, and, and stealing people to work as slaves on the plantations. Um, the settler culture was both religious and oppressive. And we need to ask ourselves, as Cardinal Altamirano comes to ask, can one take the one and leave the other? Is it possible to have the one without the other? Mendoza comes down with his slaves riding backwards, tied to horses. He sells them to the plantation owner, uh, Spanish plantation owner whose name slips my mind for the moment. Um, but it raises the question of, of and as he goes into the, the settler town down on the plains, raises the question, 
um, because colonizers and missionaries share a culture, and yet the culture throws up such different responses to to the locals. And uh, what are the Spanish and Portuguese cultures like that that emerge in this movie? How important is it to know one's own culture? What what are some good and good points and bad points of your culture, my culture? This movie is excellent for for raising those those issues. Then this this violent Mendoza. It's a long story which you can see if you watch the movie. He ends up killing his brother in a duel. Now, <clears throat> in those times, a a a duel was a, a legally acceptable, and the fact that he killed his brother was, you know, they were both armed, so it wasn't murder, but, but that doesn't affect him. He's deeply remorseful. He's completely broken because he loved the brother, but the brother just, well, the brother took his girl, basically. And so he's, we find him sitting in the, the a cell at the monastery, at the Jesuit monastery, um, sick to death of himself, refusing to eat. And um, I mean, it's hard to believe that a man like Mendoza can change, but it is credible that remorse can deeply affect one's choices in life. Anyway, uh, Father Gabriel goes to visit him and laughs at him and challenges him and uh, it's a very interesting interchange but I, I can't go through <laughs> that I can't go through the whole movie you must watch the movie and uh, Mendoza decides that that for penance for what he's done to his brother and what he's done to to the Guarani that he will drag all his armor and weaponry in a net up the mountain, up the waterfall, and throw himself on their mercy, and they can execute him <clears throat> in vengeance for, for the death that he's brought to them. He's going up to die. Uh, I come across this every now and again, that people are involved in mission as an act of penance. Which seems a pity, because I would rather like to see it as an act of, of obedience. But God gets God moves people in different ways, I suppose. Um, he drags this impossibly heavy load of, of weaponry up through the muddy jungle. He gets covered in mud. He it fall, rolls back down into the river. He goes back and fetches it. He hauls it with him the waterfall um, he emerges at the top and of course the Guarani see their old enemy and and one of their soldiers runs to him whips out his knife and and asks the question shall I cut his throat here or what and they discuss to and fro and once again this is a position of weakness to strength isn't it and they decide instead to cut the rope. So they cut the rope. And in a wonderfully symbolic moment, the burden rolls down the cliff and splashes into the, the pool at the bottom of the waterfall far away. And so he, and he bursts into tears and they laugh at his tears. And it's, a, it's actually a very moving scene. But you've got to ask whether it was wise for the Guarani to, to forgive this mercenary. And I wonder why they did forgive him. Uh, perhaps it's the influence of Father Gabriel and, and the gospel that's already working in them. And it raises the question how, of how often missionaries need to be forgiven, eh? for all sorts of things. And then we have a period of, of peace and calm as the, as the mission station is built. <laughs> they build this huge cathedral-like structure, sort of 
closest facsimile of of uh, European architecture. Uh, there's a lot about culture and mission here, and uh, and. Mendoza gradually becomes enculturated or, or adapts. One stage they they lead him aside and, and paint uh, his chest with Guarani war paint. And um, it's interesting how important was it to to adapt to each other's culture. The building of the buildings that was an accession to to western uh, culture, and then the wall paint that was a an accession to Guarani culture, and then for proper induction to to the tribe, the man who has just been painted with wall paint is supposed to kill a pig, so they catch this wild pig and thrust the spear at Mendoza, but he refuses to kill the pig. He refuses. He's he's trying to lay aside his his violent past. And there's a, a lovely interlude of of him reading one Corinthians thirteen, the the um, and acting it out. Um, Father Gabriel gives sets him the task of studying one Corinthians thirteen and the dimensions of love. I wonder what passage you would have given someone like that to read. And, um, yeah, how does the work of, of missionaries demonstrate love to the Guarani? How does love the, how does the work of any missionary demonstrate love, carry love, embody love? And eventually Mendoza decides that he's going to join up. He's going to become a Jesuit brother. And they have a, a lovely ceremony where he dons the robe, which they call the livery of labor and humility. Such a nice description of clerical garb. But is mission always done with hard work and humility, with labor and humility? Or sometimes with technology and arrogance? Hmm. The mission, is, the mission is, is a superb movie. Uh, but I'm going to break it there for today. I think that the... Um, It's a piece of art that gives us a, a window into the past through which we are able to gaze. And in the light of what we see, we're able to reflect on what we are doing in the present. Let's pray together. Loving Father, your church has tried to obey your call to mission with such a mixture of passion and blindness, arrogance and kindness. Please help us to see what we are not seeing about ourselves. Amen. If you haven't seen this movie, I'll be carrying on tomorrow with the second half and, and it's a serious spoiler. Um, but uh, it's really worth spreading these ideas. Please take them. Don't just leave them lying. Take them, pass them on, um, ask the same questions of other people. And, and please like my, uh, uh, my broadcast or uh, show that you're there. <laughs> Make comments, then I, can, then I can interact with you and, and we can work on these issues together uh, and certainly I need help from others still as I as I work through the concepts of mission and after after lockdowns over sometime in the future when it's safe to gather together again you could invite discipling nations to run this course or other courses that we have 
uh, to help your church <clears throat> work through the issues of, of its involvement in the mission of God. That's it for today, guys. In the meantime, stay soapy.